Larry Brown is the definition of a basketball lifer. A back in the day hooper out of Brooklyn, he played at North Carolina for both legendary coaches Frank McGuire and Dean Smith. He won a gold on Team USA in 1964. He played in the ABA winning a championship and was a three-time All-Star. As a coach, he won a national championship for Kansas in 1988 and an NBA championship with the Pistons in 2004. He coached legends including Allen Iverson, Reggie Miller, and David Robinson, and now at 81, he is the assistant coach on Penny's Memphis staff. Larry Brown is a basketball lifer. Beyond his knowledge and experience, Penny knows Coach Brown has that true coaching gift, the ability to connect with his players. Basketball really is Coach Brown's life. It's what gives him energy and what keeps him going. As he tells us, the game has definitely changed from one generation to the next. While some principles may stay the same, it has evolved for the better. Now both Penny and Larry are positioned to move the game forward by knowing where it came from. So here it is, an incredible basketball conversation with Penny and Coach Larry Brown. It's the Two Cents Podcast. Subscribe so you get every episode of Real Basketball Talk as soon as they drop wherever you get your podcast. What's up, everybody? Penny Hardaway here. Just want to welcome you back to my Two Cents Podcast. It has been a minute. Missed you guys. Uh, we have a special guest today, so that doesn't need any introduction. Coach Larry Brown. Welcome, Coach Larry Brown, to the My Two Cents Podcast. It's good to be here, Penny. I'm a nervous wreck, worrying about what you're going to ask me. <laughs> Coach, we'll give you softball today, but no, honestly, it's been an honor to have you on campus and have you with us, so this interview will definitely go smooth. I'm ready for it then. Okay, my first question is, why are you still coaching right now, Coach? I mean, you don't have, we know you don't have to do it, but what, what makes you want to wake up every morning and come to the gym and still coach? Well, I'm kind of like you, Penny. Uh, you and I are living a, a dream. You know, I've always wanted to be involved in sports in some way. Um, people that other than my family that I had the greatest influence on me were coaches. Um, I lost my dad when I was young, so, you know, my coaches became like father figures, and uh, I've been stealing my whole life. I never <laughs> I've never never gone to work a day in my life. Um, I love being around kids. I love being around coaches like you that care about kids that are great role models. and. I've been blessed. I, you know, I had the greatest coaches in my life, um, and I just want to share what they taught me with young kids. So obviously, that's what keeps you going. That the the love of kids and sharing your knowledge. Yeah, I mean, you know, you and I have talked about it. You know, you have a lot of things on your plate, but when you walk in here, it's all about the kids. It's all about the game. It's all about teaching them not only how to be players, but how to be grown-ups, you know. And, uh, you know, I just love smelling the gym and being around people that want to teach the game. And I want to be around kids that aspire to be like you. Because, you know, this program is a program that I think is a stepping stone for kids that want to someday play at the highest level. and. It's fun for me to be part of that. Well, I, you know, I know you, and we all know you as Coach Brown, but can you take us back down to play Larry Brown? What started you in the basketball? Um, how did you get to Carolina? And then your career in basketball? Well, um, I liked anything with the ball. You know, growing up in my era, you played baseball, basketball, and football, depending on the season. Um, so I, I loved all the sports. I grew up in Brooklyn, and then when my dad passed, we moved to Long Island, and my grandfather had a bakery. And we lived on top of the bakery, and across the street was a famous playground. And pros and college guys used to come in the summer and the spring and the fall and play and then go to the beach. So I'd watch them, and uh, you know, I was so young, I didn't get picked out very often to play because if you lost you had to sit for a long time right. so 
But I used to be the first guy out there when I was 13. I'd bring a ball, and if there were only five guys, we only played half court. So if there were only five guys, I'd get to play. And then the other way I'd get to play is I'd go out and buy them drinks and bring <laughs> them back. Um, and as I got older, I became better, and I got to play more. And, you know, Red Holstman, who coached the Knicks, used to play out there. There were pro players, college players. And when we were growing up, you got better because you played with older players that taught you how to play and taught you to respect the game. So I loved it. And all I wanted to do was, you know, play at the highest level. And at that time, there was just the NBA, and they only had like 120 players, and I'm five, barely 5'10". Five, hmm. There wasn't a lot of room for Larry Brown to play there, but I got to play. Um, I played on the Olympic team. I came back. Coach Smith offers me, asked me to coach with him, and I had played at North Carolina. Coach McGuire, Frank McGuire, who's in the Hall of Fame, he recruited my mom. She said, you're going to North Carolina. <laughs> and then I was lucky enough, Coach Smith was his assistant. So now I'm with two Hall of Fame coaches. Coach McGuire left to coach the Sixers. At that time, they were the Warriors with Will Chamberlain. Coach Smith took over. I played for him. And then after the Olympics, he asked me to come back to coach. And then like a fool, after two years, I left to play in the ABA. Mm -hmm. um, and I got my first pro coaching job, Penny, because nobody wanted the job. And I was one of the older players, and they said, you know, you got a coach, so. Did you always know you wanted to be, when you were a player, did you have the, the wherewithal to say, okay, after I'm done, I'm going to be a coach, or was it just thrusted on you? Like you said, you were the oldest guy, and they gave you the job. Yeah, I, because of the influence of the coaches had on my life, I wanted to be like them. But I, I assumed I was going to be a high school coach, coach baseball, football, and basketball, teach American history. Um, because when I was growing up, there was a famous um, basketball coach named Claire B., coach at LIU. And uh, I think he's the winningest coach in the history of college basketball. He used to write a series of, of children's books called Chip Hilton, and he was a uh, a great athlete, played baseball, basketball, and football in American Legion in the summertime. And his coach was a guy named Rockwell. So I wanted to be just like like Rockwell. And uh, But you know how things change. I didn't assume I was going to be a pro coach. And all of a sudden, that job came to me. I always felt I was more of a teacher, and I didn't know if you could teach in the pros. But I soon found out. If you're with the right guys, you can teach. Now, your connection to Coach Smith, your relationship, can you speak on that? Because obviously he was influential in your life. Yeah, he's the most unique person I've ever been around. Um, he came from Emporia, Kansas. His dad was a coach. Um, he's a really, really religious person. I think every night he used to go to bed and read the scripture. Um, he never got into work early. Um, he was a really, really unbelievable human being. When he was in a junior high school, the junior high school in Kansas was integrated. When he went to high school, it was segregated. And as a 13-year-old, he went before the school board and told them he didn't think it was fair. And that's the way he lived his life, Penny. Uh, he, when we were having the Civil Rights mo Movement, he sat in on the luncheon, you know, the luncheonettes to make sure that they were not going to be segregated. Um, when I was there, we recruited the first black athlete at the University of North Carolina, Charles Scott. And he was actually the first black athlete f playing in the ACC other than Maryland. Maryland had one you know, kid on scholarship that was on the basketball team. And when Coach recruited Charles, you know, things weren't going great for him at that time. You know, the basketball scandal took place. Um, Carolina's program and North Carolina State program was hit hard. We were only allowed to play 16 games my junior year, 20 games my senior year. Coach lost a lot of players after Coach McGuire left. 
So his first five years was, was not really great. But the chancellor of the school loved him so much and felt he was such a great human being and role model that he kept him. And after that, I think he never won less than 27 games for the rest of his career. And I know I'm talking too lo loud, but this is the craziest story. I was with the Sixers in Chapel Hill when we were practicing for the regular season. And it was October 8th. And he walked into the office and told me he was re resigning. And I said, Coach, well, something's got to be wrong. Are you sick? He said, no, I'm just tired of all the stuff I have to go through that's aside from coaching. You know, all the, you know, recruiting and functions and all this. He said, I just love to coach, but I'm, I'm tired of it. And, but the reality is he left at such a late date that the only guy that they could hire was Bill Guthridge. And Bill was with him for 36 years. Bill took my place when I left Carolina to go play in the ABA. Bill didn't want the job, but he had no choice. And Coach made sure he got a two-year deal, and he left him possibly the best team he ever had coming back. A little different than the guy in Durham who's resigning after a victory tour of one year. Right. Right. I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> but no, that's, uh, that's all great. Uh, the history and the stories of talking to you on a daily basis about Coach Smith, Coach McGuire, just the understanding of how the systems were back in the day at, uh, at Carolina and through your basketball career. And now we're jumping to the NBA. You go from the Chapel Hill era to the NBA now. You know, you, you did UCLA, Kansas, and Chapel Hill, but Chapel Hill is – your baby, that's, 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 the, that's the family. Now you go to the NBA, and you've told, you've told me about players that were really good that I have never heard of, but you've also heard of coach some players that I've heard of, Reggie Miller, Allen Iverson, even Ben Wallace, who was you know just inducted into the Hall of Fame. How was the experiences of coaching those guys on the next level? Well, it's, it's fun. You know, last night I was texting with a lot of our players, you know, especially Omani. He texts me all the time, and I – I told him about David Thompson, David Robinson, and Allen Iverson. And I was kind of sharing with Amani, because here's a kid, you know, we know he's been on the cover of Sports Illustrated at 15. He had a school named after him. He had an AAU na team named after him. Now he's here with us. And I said, you know, I've never been around any players other than the three I mentioned that had as much scrutiny and pressure as you've had um, and it's amazing how he comes to practice every day and wants to learn wants to get better and he's here because of you I think you know I've said this to everybody they said why are you with Penny well Penny doesn't say how you have to act he shows you how to act by the way he conducts himself so getting back I you know it's tough to coach great players um, I always felt pressure to make sure that I gave them an opportunity to play as well as they were capable of playing. You know, it's, and I, I'm not knocking Eric Snow, but Eric Snow is a guy that played for 14 years, but nobody expected Eric to be the best player in the NBA or to every night go out and get 35. You know, but Allen and David and D Robinson and David Thompson. Every time they stepped out on the floor, people are expecting them to be a highlight reel and play special. And I always felt kind of a little pressure myself because you don't want to ever hold guys back. So, but it's stealing in the NBA, Penny. Right. You go to work, you have practice, and you go home. All right, let's take a two cents timeout to talk about our good friends at DraftKings. You know, the NBA is back, and at DraftKings Sportsbook, an authorized sports betting partner of the NBA, the key to victory is a strong starting five. New customers can bet just $5 on any NBA team to win their game, and if they do, you win $200 in free bets. For once, we're not talking pennies, we're talking dollars. Big bucks. DraftKings Sportsbook customers can also get skin in the game with the new Same Game Parlays. Combine multiple bets from the same game for a bigger payout. The more legs you add, the more money you can win. 
DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. And best of all, you can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. So all you got to do, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the promo code PENNY. Bet just $5 on any NBA team to win their game and win $200 in free bets. If they win, you win with promo code PENNY this week at DraftKings Sportsbook, an authorized sports betting partner of the NBA. There's no extra recruiting. There's no extra time that you have to be watching film with players to bring them up to speed on things. Uh, there are no, they're rookies, but they're no freshmen. Freshmen are coming in really freshmen. Rookies are coming in. They kind of know a little bit more than the average, you know, freshman coming into college. I think a rookie in the NBA knows a lot more than him. So you don't have to be in there like we do on the phone all day recruiting guys and then watching lots of film and things of that nature. But the least likely guy out of that group that I named is Ben Wallace, a guy that most people know. A lot of people might not know, but you watch the old film, you'll see he was just a hard worker grinder. Gets into the Hall of Fame, and these kids are only, you know, Alan Iverson, yes, unbelievable. Reggie Miller, David Thompson, David Robinson, all great. But Ben Wallace wasn't supposed to be in the Hall of Fame if the story was written by someone else. Talk about being. No, that's Rashid Wallace and I went to his induction ceremony. Ben asked me to present him. Um, I think he's the only guy in the Hall of Fame who wasn't drafted. Um, I'm pretty sure of that. He also um, was picked, I think he was asked to go to Boston as a 6 8 guy, and they tried to make him a two guard. They cut him. That's pretty funny. I'm sorry for interrupting for having Ben Wallace. The Ben Wallace that we know and love, the defender, the shot blocker, the finisher to be a two guard. That, that's pretty funny. I know. Yeah, I talked to Ben about that. He said, well, Coach, I was thin, thinner and, you know, people cramped my style. I should have been a two guard. <laughs> but, but the reality is he gets cut by them. He played at a great historical black college, Virginia Union, had a great coach, Coach Robbins, who I think taught him the right way. So he had all the things that we would admire. He mm -hmm. cared about winning. He wasn't afraid of hard work. He respected his teammates. He respected the game. So Washington saw something in him. Um, they picked him up. I think he was averaging like four points a game and eight rebounds, barely playing, but having an impact on the game, Penny, which you talk about all the time. There's so many things you can do to help your team other than putting the ball in the basket. And by Ben getting into the Hall of Fame and being recognized as a guy that impacted the game in other areas other than scoring, I think is a great lesson for young kids. Um, but he goes from Orlando, I mean from Washington to Orlando and played well. I think he played a little bit more. He had similar statistics, maybe eight and six, a few blocks. And Joe Dumars recognizes his talent. And uh, Joe makes this unbelievable trade to send Ben Wallace to Orlando for a guy named Grant Hill, who you and I, will, if he wasn't hurt, you and Grant Hill to me, and I'm not just saying it because of this podcast, but you and Grant careers were cut short because of injuries. Shout out to G here, my guy. He texted me last week, so we still keep in touch. It's amazing. So then Joe gets him. He comes with us. Grant had that injury, never recovered. Um, and Ben was just, you know, he like we said before, he impacted the game, not only in the game, in practice, in the locker room, in the way he conducted his life. He was... He was as good a teammate as I've ever been around and as hard a worker as I've ever been around. Yeah, for kids who all are out there thinking that you have to score 30 points a game, we're talking to the bigs. When I coached high school, when I coached AAU, when I coached well, yeah, high school and AAU, I told our bigs, if you rebound, if you run, you sprint the floor, you sprint in the screens, you shot block, then you have a very good chance of making it to the NBA and making a lot of money, which was not – it was not pleasing to, for them to hear that. They want to be, well, I need, to, I need to touch the ball. I need to score. And Ben Wallace showed us that being probably the only undrafted player to go into the Hall of Fame, that if you just master your craft at what you're doing, what he did really well was he was a high-energy guy that blocked shots, rebounds, ran the floor and screen. 
and won championships while, while being a big piece of, of the puzzle uh, on those championship teams. And, you know, kids just need to understand that, that part. Yeah, the, the thing that I think we lose sight of, Penny, is when I was growing up, I played freshman basketball. It was all fundamentals. And then when I got to the varsity, my sophomore year, I was just hoping to get minutes. And by the time I was a junior, with the freshman year and the sophomore year, I think I was ready to play. And most kids, you know, you, you were different, but most kids went four years to college. Then when they went to an NBA team, it was all veterans. They probably sat on the bench for three years, developed their craft, and then played. Now, these kids think right out of high school they're ready for the NBA. And, you know, I love the kids we have, but fundamentally, they're way behind. And when you were talking about Ben and what he did, I, I talked to Jalen the other day. The three R's, run, rebound, and roll, and you can make a lot of money. And unfortunately, these kids all think that if they don't get drafted after the first year, they're a failure. Yeah. And David Robinson, David Thompson, all those guys, you know, Tim Duncan, they went four years to school. Um, so when they went there, they were ready. And that's what I think you're trying to do with our kids, trying to give them the fundamentals and the background so if they do are fortunate enough to go further, they understand how to play. Yeah, those days of being patient are, are long gone. These kids are so micro, this is a microwave era to me. They don't want you know how you bake things, it takes much longer in the oven. They want microwave, they want 10 seconds, okay, I want one year and then I'm done. And a lot of these kids have ruined their careers by going too soon and not get drafted, you know, and have nothing really to fall back on. So I think patience is something that really needs to come back into basketball because the fundamentals need to be better. Potential is a big word nowadays, and that's what I talk about with our era versus their era. The guys had to know how to play back when I was coming into the league and before I came into the league. It was a bunch of veterans that were professional about how they played the game, and they had to know how to play. Nowadays, potential of what you can be down the line can get you drafted, and that's a little risky. Yeah, that that worries me because, you know, you were fortunate. As, as great as you were, you, you had a great coach and you went to a team that had older guys along with some young guys, but that taught you how to be a pro, how to play. Um, and I see this all the time. Uh, Tim Jankovic, coach in SMU, was with me. He, he had a theory that if you score 15 points in one Division I college game, you're one and done. <laughs> and I used to laugh at him, but the reality is they think they are. And, and I didn't have to deal with social media. So a lot of these kids, even though they would want to stay because college is such a great, great time, a lot of the outside influences want them to leave. They have the pressure not only to make their lives better, but sometimes make their family's life better. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that. I know you didn't no, have that. No, not at all. I know you've been able to make your family's life better, but I, that's what worries me. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm going to get in trouble, but this overtime league, it worries me because we're making kids pros as 15 and 16 year olds. And you just said it. What if we don't make it? You know, they're saying, oh, we're going to give money to go back to college. But I'm worried about that, you know. And we know not everybody gets drafted. I, I think um, there were so many kids that didn't get drafted this year. There's only 60. And now with Europe and Africa and Asia, the number of players in the United States getting drafted is smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. So what do they do if they don't have a college degree, if they're not able to play? And the one thing people forget about is the Exhibit 10 players that are still waiting to get into the league. They're kind of going half and half with the G League and the NBA. So you got to deal with those players, the new players getting drafted. So it's so much going on. So have you changed your approach of how you coach from when you first started on what you believe in uh, to now to kind of adjust to the players of this era? No, <laughs> you know that. <laughs> um, you know, I t I've been lucky. I got, I've had some of the greatest coaches coach me and some of the greatest coaches sit by me. Some of the brightest players that I coach that have shared their knowledge with me. 
Um, and I tell all these coaches, as long as you right, you're right and the kids trust you, you got to be relentless in teaching them what you think they need to do to get better to help our team be successful. And if you let them win, you not you have no chance. And uh, and I've you know we talked about this, but I took over nine NBA teams, and I've coached at Carolina, Kansas, UCLA, and. I, by going in the NBA, I only coached one team that won. And that was the Pistons. And I was lucky. Rick Carlisle had great values. So it was an easy adjustment for me. But uh, but the one thing I know, if you develop the trust in players and you they know you care, you can do anything. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we talk about it all the time with our players and we're here for them. And I know some days are hard. But ultimately, all we're trying to do is, is to get them to be better. They have them understand how serious this is if you're really trying to make it to the next level. And they're in a great place being here at Memphis with us. And I definitely appreciate you, Rashid, and Cody being a part of this this, this entire thing for us because we have big plans ahead. And uh, we thank you so much for, for coming out and joining us, Coach Brown. Thank you so much. Thanks, Penny. I'm looking forward to today. Oh, no, I'm looking forward to today as well, which is our pro day. And thanks so much for tuning in to my two cents. Peace.